All right, open your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 39. And really, I'm going to deal with the entire 40th chapter, but I'm not going to read all that. I'm just going to read this portion from chapter 39, and then we'll pick our way through the 40th chapter. Chapter 39, verse 19, okay? So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner... That his anger was aroused. Now you remember we're picking up from last week when Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife and she tried to lure him in to lay with her. And uh, he did like Forrest Gump. He ran, ran, ran. And he ran away and he got away from that temptation, right? But he paid the price for it. Verse 20. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him favor. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all of the prisoners who were in the prison. Doesn't this sound familiar? Whatever they did there, it was his doing. And listen to this. It's so familiar to Potiphar's situation. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Isn't that awesome? That here we go again in the life of Joseph, this cycle again of being uh, wronged and injustice happens and he's placed in prison. He's placed in the king's prison here and it looks like, okay, okay man, my brothers have betrayed me. My family was a little bit dysfunctional. I've been sold into slavery. Now Potiphar's wife has... has, uh, you know, tricked me, deceived me. Now I've been, I've been betrayed one more time and thrown into this pit or this, this prison rather. And, and now this whole thing is happening again. It would have been the perfect opportunity for him to just say, I quit. I'm done. This is stupid. Bye. This whole, my life is ruined. He could have played the role of the victim. He could have you know, made excuses, after blamed this, this, that, and the other. But notice what happens to him. He gets in there, and he gets favor more than anyone else in the prison. So much so that he's, he's running the whole place. Now, there's been papyri found, which are ancient scroll documents. There have been papyri found from ancient Egypt that actually describe a prison in this area. And so we believe it's the prison that Joseph probably was in. And it was a prison for king's prisoners... And uh, it, was, it was known in Egyptian as the place of confinement. The place of confinement. And we also learn from these papyri documents that there would be a warden over the prison, which we see. And that that warden would have a chief scribe. Someone who could write and, you know, do documents for him and stuff. And so scholars think that Joseph was that. That he was the chief scribe, maybe, in this prison. And he took over, he took charge administratively of everything that was going on. But what I want to look at this morning is his character and his integrity. Especially uh, in light of when everything goes wrong and everything is broken. And I came across a phrase this week that's been in my heart, man, and I can't get it out of my mind. And that is, he went into the prison of promotion. I want you to get this. He went into the prison of promotion. Because what looked like a terrible thing once again in Joseph's life turns out to be the place from which God uses him and God speaks to him and God elevates him to the highest point in the kingdom of Egypt. Can we say amen? So he maintains his integrity in the prison of promotion. He maintains his integrity in the prison of promotion. Now, let's, a couple things I want to lay down here. First of all is the term character. The term character comes from a Greek term. You know what, it's, what the Greek is? Character. That's it in Greek. But in Greek, the term character was an inscribing tool or uh, a tool for embossing or making an imprint. So, it, so character meant that imprint, that impression in something. Like in a, the king's ring, when it was being fashioned in the fire, it was imprinted with a certain stamp, and it took that character. 
What we're looking for is that the character of God be imprinted on our lives. Imprinted on our lives. And there's another term that I think goes hand in hand with character, and that's the term integrity. Integrity comes from the word, Latin word, integer. And the term integer means a whole number. Something that's whole. No division. No separateness. It's whole. So while Joseph went through this prison of promotion, so to speak, his integrity was maintained. He maintained his integrity in Potiphar's house. He maintained his integrity in the, uh, in the prison, even though he was betrayed and put in there. And we're going to see he gets betrayed again in the prison. He gets forgotten about. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many remember last year, Kent Christmas came to our breaking barriers? And he dropped something on us. And he said, you know, we need to start renaming things in our lives. Because we've been calling stuff, you know, defeat and negative and all this. And we need to start renaming some things in our lives. So right now, I want us to rename the bad places we're walking through. And the difficult places, the places of confinement that we're walking through. And I want us to rename it the prison of promotion. And start seeing the circumstance that you're walking through right now in a different light. Because you're going to come through it. Your integrity is going to be maintained. And your character is going to shine through. Can we say amen? amen. Hallelujah. So I just think it's important. I was listening this week to, I did some traveling this week and uh, to meetings. And I was listening to podcasts. And I love this one podcast by the BBC that deals with ancient philosophy. And so they were talking about the foundations of philosophy from Plato's Republic all the way up to Kant's empirical, uh, categorical imperatives and all that kind of stuff. But it, it impressed me that the thought came out of Western society with the, with the philosophers and stuff. That they used to argue, why do people do certain actions? And why does, what should one do in this situation, like an ethics thing? And so, you know, Socrates kind of came up with this thinking that we do right actions not just because it helps us in the moment or not just because we get gain out of it or any other reason, but we should do right actions because it's the right thing. And I wonder if we haven't lost that somewhat in modern society that everybody wants to know, well, what's in it for me? But really the right thing to do is just to do the right thing. That's integrity. Integrity is just to do the right thing whether you get praise or no praise, money or no money, whether it costs you something or doesn't, we should just do the right thing because it's the right thing. Tony Dungy, many of you know, he's a former NFL player and he became coach of Tampa Bay and then Indianapolis Colts later. He said this, he said, integrity is the choice between what's convenient and what's right. It's the choice between what's convenient and what's right. Joseph chose not what was convenient, but he chose to do the right thing, and we'll see that God blessed him in the end, and God's going to bless you in the end when you choose to do the right thing. Can you shout amen? amen. So I'm going to look at some action steps here that you're to do while you're in the prison of promotion. Okay? Joseph was, we learn from chapter 41, imprisoned for two entire years. Joseph had the royal cupbearer with him in prison at the time. And he had the royal baker with him in prison at the time. And if you remember, each of those guys had dreams. And they brought them to Joseph. And of course, he was gifted in that area. And he knew that all the dream interpretation belonged to God. And he interpreted their dreams... And he told the cupbearer, he said, just in a few days, you're going to be re returned to your position in the kingdom. And he told the baker, he said, but in a few days, the king's going to have your head. And those interpretations happened exactly as Joseph had said. The, the, the baker's head was taken off and the cupbearer's position was restored. Joseph just asked the cupbearer one thing. He said, just, just please 
when you get back up there, just remember me. Don't forget about your prison buddy. Just remember me when you get back up there. So what happens? The royal cupbearer gets his position back, and he forgets about Joseph. Once again, Joseph has an injustice. He forgets about Joseph. So Joseph could have gotten just really bitter, but instead of getting bitter, he got better. Come on, I, I heard Wayne say it. Instead of getting bitter, he got better. Look at somebody and say, don't get bitter. No, you get better. In the prison of promotion, we look, it's very easy to fall into bitterness and all this kind of vengeance. That's the Lord's. You don't get bitter, you get better. Hallelujah. So the first thing I want you to know is that in the prison of promotion, there is a design in your distress. There is a design in your distress. What do I mean by that? Even though it looks like nothing is happening and it looks like no forward progress is being made in your life and you aren't fulfilling your destiny and dreams and all this stuff, yes, you are. Because God is behind the scenes working a plan for you that is greater than you could ever imagine or ever think. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And He's working something with such wisdom and skill and precision that we can't figure it out. And sometimes I think if He let us in on it, it would blow our minds. Lift your hand and say, thank God He's working on my behalf. He's working on my behalf. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, Beloved, do not think it strange. Do not think it's weird concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Yeah, you're going through a trial. The first thing we want to think of is, Man, why is this happening to me? This is unfair. I raised two girls. When they were young, everything's unfair. She got this, I didn't get this, she didn't. Blah, 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 blah. We're like, Jiminy Christmas. <laughs> Forget fair. Let's just live in peace, man. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> don't think it's weird. Don't think it's unfair. Don't think, just know, you're going to go through some stuff. The fiery trial, as though something happened that was weird or out of place. Hey, what does it mean? You're suffering. Maybe you're suffering losses. Your heartaches, they aren't a surprise. They're a plan. <laughs> the people who've betrayed you, it's not a surprise. It's a plan. The distress you're going through, it is a destruction. There's a design in it. And I'm not saying God sends all the bad on us. I personally don't believe that. I don't believe God's our problem. I believe God's our solution. But God knows that we're going to go through all this stuff. So he works a design and he works a plan as we walk through it to perfect our faith and to perfect our character as we go through it. Raise your hand one more time and say, there is a design in my distress. Second thing I want you to know about the prison of promotion is that when you get in there and God brings you out or when you're in or when you're out or you're in between, don't seek vengeance. Because when we get in tight spots, we often blame others and we want somebody to pay and to pay dearly. You know, it's like the outlaw Jesse James or it's like the outlaw Josie Wales. His whole family gets killed. He's from Missouri. The red leg people from Kansas come and kill them all, burn their house down. So what does the outlaw Josie well? He runs, but he gets vengeance in the end. That's what Westerns are about. And he's bad to the bone. I shouldn't do this, but my brother and dad love Western, so I can go all day. But a bounty hunter comes after him and walks in the saloon. And Josie Wells is like, you don't want to do this. So he walks out. And he comes back. And he says, I have to do it. Man's got to make a living. 
And Josie Wales looks at him and says, Dying ain't much of a living. <laughs> you just feel bad to the bone when you see that. Right? Okay, I'm not recommending those movies, by the way. We're Pentecostals, praise God. Marvel Comics, let's go there. Often the superheroes are getting revenge on somebody. We love these revenge stories. Kill them at the end. Get them. Come on. Get them. Knock them out. We want to see that revenge. God says, no. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. If you seek vengeance, it's going to poison your spirit. And, all your, and it's going to torment you. You're the one who's going to be in prison. Because if you seek vengeance, it's going to eat you alive. It's going to burn you up. It's going to wear you out. Notice Romans 11. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give, but, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry... Golly, this is not Jesse James. This is not the outlaw Jesse Wells. This is not Iron Man. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For so, or in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire. Paul was sharp. He said, yeah, it's going to work out in the end, but God's going to do it, not you. And you're going to be free. You're going to bless and you're going to love and you're going to heap good stuff, and God's going to bring the justice. Because it isn't in our hands, it's in the hands of man. I just preached y'all a message right there. You need to get free on that. Can somebody say amen? amen? What else do we do in the prison of promotion? Well, don't panic. But wait on the Lord. Don't panic, but wait on the Lord. Because when we get in those tough times... It's like, it's, it's, we get nervous, man. Is God going to show up? I need to take matters into my own hands. I thought this was going to work out. I need to do this. Everybody's betrayed me. I'm going to get moving and I'm going to get to shaking here. God says, wait on me. Because there's a timing for things. And there's a season for everything. And I'm going to tell you something. It's not fun going through periods of brokenness. But when we go through periods of brokenness, it really becomes the sweetest moments. And when we look back on them, we realize that God built into us stuff during the seasons of brokenness that I just don't know any other way He could have built into us unless we went through it. Vance Havner, a great Baptist preacher, said this, God uses broken things, broken soil to produce a crop. Broken clouds to give rain. Broken grain to give bread. Broken bread to give strength. A broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. So some of you may be on the verge of promotion that God's preparing and preparing for you. And He doesn't announce these things before time. While you're waiting... Stay under the Lord's hand and remember joy comes in the morning. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Waiting on the Lord is not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. Notice Revelation. When he opened the fifth seal, <laughs> hallelujah. For those of you who have been with me on Wednesday night, I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And notice the cry of the martyrs in the book of Revelation. What was their cry? How long, O oh Lord, holy and true, until you bring vengeance? How long? This is the cry of man. How long until you're going to bring justice in the earth? So men have gone awry or astray trying to figure out systems of justice by themselves. Karl Marx, no, we're going to make everything just. We're going to take, seize everyone's property and goods. And the government's going to redistribute it. Mao Zedong, we're going to take over China. We're going to re-educate everyone, seize their properties. We're going to bring justice, but it's going to be... And always when we get to that point, it fails because it isn't a God thing. It's a man thing. 
brokenness is not a bad place to be. In fact, Wayne Harris said this to me when he was working with us three years ago, and I put it on a sticky note and stuck it to my desk, and it was this. Never trust an unbroken leader. Never trust an unbroken leader. Because, man, it, when you've been broken and you've been through some things, it, it shifts the whole chemistry of your spirit, so to speak. And you, you, you learn how to walk and how to not give up. Because you've been like, I've been through the fire, and I've been through the fire several times, and I'm not quitting. Amen. Devil, you've already tried, and I haven't given up yet. Amen. Saying, I'm not going to give up in the future either. Can somebody say amen? amen? Don't panic, but wait on the Lord. Now, last thing, in the prison of promotion, when promotion comes, it came for Joseph. Finally, the Pharaoh had a dream. And the cupbearer was like, oh, snap. There's a guy I know. He's down in prison, and he's a dream interpreter. And what they do? They went and got him. They, they, they shaved him because the Egyptians wanted all clean. You know, you look at the movies, I think they would portray the Egyptians all clean shaven and hair done and eyebrows and makeup and cats running around. <laughs> what? What do men of God look like? Long hair and beards. <laughs> Thought I'd get some Duck Dynasty love on that one, right? But yeah, the men of God came in like. Sorry. They had him shaved, they had him, they had him cleaned up, and they brought him before Pharaoh. And then he interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and then boom, in one second, one instance, a one moment, he is placed second in command to Pharaoh. The boy who had been betrayed by his family, sold into slavery, betrayed by Potiphar's wife, forgotten about in prison, is taken all the way to the second in command of the kingdom. That, my friend, is the favor of God on a person's life. A person maintained their integrity, kept their character, walked through the fire, and then in the season and in the right moment... Listen to me, please. Lord, I'm about to shout. Listen... You think it's nothing, nothing's happening. You're just going through this season. We're just learning. Okay, what do you want me to learn, Lord? I've been learning for a long time. Yeah, but let me tell you something. When God brings you out and puts you in a position, had you not had those years, had you not had those bad experiences, had you not had those circumstances, had you not had those trials, you wouldn't have built in you what you need for the situation that God's bringing you into. What does a college education do for someone? So I was talking with someone about this the other day. It puts you under undue stress for four years or seven years or longer. But it puts you through stress, undue stress. Why? So when you get out, you can handle some stuff that's thrown your way. Why does the military do boot camp? To break you down, man. And to put you through undue stress so that when you get under fire, you will not run and get out of there. But when people start shooting, if they took you, if Howard was in Vietnam, and James, if they took you and dropped you off and you'd never gone through boot camp, and you heard the first bombs go off, you... But you've been through boot camp. You've had a drill instructor in your face ripping you, man. Why? It's all part of the process, Lord Jesus. It's all part of the process to get you ready for the fight that God's bringing you in. I wish somebody would preach with me this morning. Come on. Punch somebody and say, it's all been part of the process. And here could be the greatest thing of the day. When you get to that place of favor, you need to be thankful and not prideful. Because when Joseph gets there, he stands before the king. And the king's like, here's my dreams. He says, listen, king, I'm nothing in so many words. All of that belongs to the Lord. 
Think about him standing in his father's house years before as a young teenager. Dad, I had a dream. All of my brothers, he didn't say it this way, but it's the interpretation. All my brothers were bowing down at my feet. And even you and mom bowed down at my feet. Why did I say that, man? Years later, he's standing before Pharaoh, and he's been through the pit. He's been through Potiphar's house. He's been through the prison. And he stands there and he says, it's all the Lord. If he gives it, we got it. If he don't give it, we ain't got it. In my Bible reading this year, it's interesting. When I went through this passage, I never noticed this. It's in the NIV, and I don't know how it comes out in the, the King James and the other translations. But when he sent his brothers away, you know, fast-forwarding in the story, he has one of his servants put his, his chalice or his cup in Joseph's and in, in Benjamin's bag. So when they go out, it's a plan. They run, they catch Benjamin, they bring him back. But Joseph stood up and he told his brothers, he said, you should have known I would know that by divination. Now, I don't, I don't know. It, it shocked me when I heard that. And I thought, what? But I don't know that it was a bad thing. I would look into the Hebrew. But nonetheless, Joseph was basically saying, you should have known this would have been revealed to me. By the Spirit somehow. i would never seen that. That he knew... He was confident enough in what God was doing through him. And it was a trick, granted. But he said that to his brothers. It must have some basis that he knew. He knew things in the spirit. You learn things when you've been through some things. And there's no need to be prideful. Notice this. I'm going to give you some scriptures and we're going to end this thing. Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine which is dissipation but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in everything. 2 Corinthians 4.17 for our light affliction is but for a moment. And it's working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That prison was just a memory now. That pit was just a memory now. The betrayal of his brothers was just a memory now. He's sitting on top of it all. So I'll, uh, let's close with this. What do you say? Yeah, but Pastor Hans, I went through the fire and I failed. I didn't maintain my integrity. I, I felt God and I committed sin or I went astray or I did something I shouldn't have done. And now I feel that all that's, everything that's coming to me is deserved because of what I did. Well, I don't know your situation, but I just want to give you one example to close with. And that's the example of Peter, the apostle. Peter was right by the Lord's side. Burly fisherman from, from the Galilee, right? He, he walks with Jesus. He's the one that opens his big mouth. He's the one that shows up in the end. He shows up at the uh, Last Supper and Jesus says, this is what's going to happen to the Son of Man. He says, no, Lord, come on. We're with you always. I'll be with you to the very end. They're at Caesarea Philippi. He says, who do men say that I am? Finally, Peter speaks up and says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus begins to tell them how he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer. And he's like, no! He's the, he's the fighter, man. He's the one that you're thinking, I want in a foxhole with me. He's the one that's going to make it all the way. Then what happens when Jesus is arrested by the, by the soldiers that night? He's taken to Caiaphas' house before the Sanhedrin. They come up and they hit him and they start you know, just jeering, coming at him, accusations flying. And then what happens? Peter kind of follows, but he follows him in the shadows. And someone recognizes him and comes up and says, Hey, you're, you're with this Jesus guy. He says, no, no, I'm not with him. And he's walking in the shadows. Then he comes up again and someone says, Weren't you with the, 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 the Nazarene? No, that's not me. And he comes up again. And in the book of Matthew, it says that he's there and... Someone comes up and says, aren't you, aren't you with him? And 
The Bible says he begins to curse and swear, saying, I don't know the man. And think about this. He's the one who said, I'll never leave you, Lord. He's the one right by his side. He's the one pulling out the sword when the soldiers came for him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's the fighter. He's the one that's going to be there. And he denies him once, twice, three times. And he hears the rooster crow. Because Jesus said, he prophesied this. But the Bible says he did something. He says, Peter, when he heard the rooster, he remembered the word of Jesus. And he ran and he wept bitterly. I don't know, I see something hidden in those terms. He wept bitterly. I believe he repented. But you're thinking, if you've ever committed a sin that's unforgivable, would it not be betraying the Lord right at the last moment? He did it. But I believe he repented. Fast forward to Mark chapter 16. The women come down to anoint the body of Jesus. And all of a sudden they see Jesus. And he comes up and he speaks to them. And he says, I want you to go back and I want you to tell my disciples and Peter that he is going, this is the, what they're relaying the story, that he is going, going before you into the Galilee. He could have said, tell my disciples, period. Tell James. Tell John. No, he said, tell my disciples and Peter. Why did he say, I believe with all my heart, he said Peter because he knew where Peter was. That Peter was crushed and he was broken and he thought he had failed, he knew he had failed the Lord and there was no way back. In that prison of confinement, he failed. But Jesus said, you go tell him that I've risen from the dead. Then as they're meeting there, they're discussing among themselves, and Jesus walks through the walls. And he shows himself. Fast forward to Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles. They rush out into the streets, kind of like we did in Jerusalem <laughs> last year. We got kicked out, but whatever. We were rushed out. We got a little bit too Pentecostal and wild in there, but we rush out. They rushed out into the streets. And who's preaching? Peter stands up. And he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days I'll pour out my spirit, says the Lord, upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Even upon my handmaidens will I pour out of my spirit. And those that He's preaching like fire. And then 3,000 get saved and baptized. We come over to the next chapter. He walks by the gate, beautiful, going up to the temple, heals a man lame from his mother's womb and stands up and says, this man is healed because of Jesus. And he preaches. Then he's taken before the council who, listen, listen, who would have been probably the same guys who were at Caiaphas' house that night of Jesus' arrest. And they bring him before that council that night. And I wanted to re read it because it's so powerful. Chapter 4 of Acts, verse 5. And they set him in the midst of the rulers, elders, and scribes. And the high priest comes out. Verse 7. And they set him in the midst and said, By what power or by what name have you done this? Healing the blind man or healing the lame man. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means has he been made well? Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. The stone which the builders rejected has become now the chief cornerstone. He got in their face, man, and pointed fingers and let it go. Under the anointing. Same man that fell before, now forgiven because of his repentance, now baptized in the Holy Ghost, and now the chief preacher in the early part of the book of Acts. So my brother, my sister, if you failed him in the fire, there's another chance for you because he's the God of a second chance. 
He's the God of a third chance. And He's the God of a fourth chance. And He says, if you come to me and humble yourself and repent, I'm going to use you again. And I'm going to pour my glory into you. And I'm going to take you out of that prison. And I'm going to bring you to a place of favor. And there's something coming so great. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Neither has it entered into the hearts of man. What God has prepared for us. Yes, He's talking about heaven. But I believe we got a little bit of that right here in this little realm right now. Don't you? Somebody shout amen. Come on, stand to your feet in here this morning. Come on, say, I'm coming out. I'm coming out intact. Coming out with my integrity. God's bringing me out. Hallelujah, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a new season coming. There's a new day going to dawn. Come on, the sun's going to rise tomorrow. His faithfulness is going to be new to me in the morning. His mercy is going to be renewed to me tomorrow. And the next day, and the next, He's faithful. I've been unfaithful. He's ultimately faithful. Come on, raise your hand if you got something out of this today. God did something in your heart. Hallelujah. Thanks so much for listening or watching the podcast today. And I just hope the service was a great encouragement to you, great blessing to your life. Uh, I hope you get a chance to join us sometime if you're ever near or in, in Elizabeth City area because the atmosphere in this church is just, I mean, it's contagious and it's amazing. I'm constantly amazed at what God does every week in the lives of people. I'm privileged, humbled, honored to be part of it. If you're watching today and there are needs in your life, I want to say a prayer with you and pray with you over those needs. The greatest need that each person has though is for God to come into their heart and occupy that void or that vacuum that's in each human person. We were created to commune with God, to have a fellowship and relationship with Him. So if you're not serving the Lord, I'd love to pray with you. All you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Ask the Lord Jesus into your heart and an amazing life change will begin today for you. So if you'd like to pray with me, please just close your eyes, say these words with me right now. Father, I come before you in Jesus' name. I repent of all my sin. I give it all to you today. Take away the guilt, take away the shame, take away the judgment against me. I accept Jesus as the Lord of my life. Help me now to live the rest of my life as His servant and in fellowship with God. In Jesus' name we pray. And you can all say amen wherever you are, whether you're in your car, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, wherever you can praise the Lord a little bit right there in your own environment. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, join us on our website. Join us on one of our, uh, one of our social media pages. Let us know what's happened to you. We would be so encouraged and blessed to hear. So until next time, God bless.